Right, good afternoon uh, to everybody. Uh, firstly, for those uh, curious about the setting, uh, I'm having to work utterly remotely, actually from a hotel in Scotland. So this is not my front room or any other room in my house. Uh, I'm working um, mobile and agile, so please bear with me today. Um, firstly, I'm delighted to welcome everyone to today's event, uh, including the, uh, the speakers, the delegates, and also the RTPI President Wei Yang. Uh, this event aligns with uh, the aims of uh, our president and also with the UN International Day of Forests, which is on this Sunday, the 21st of March, 2021. And before I introduce our speakers, I do have the pleasure to introduce uh, our president. Uh, Wei was inaugur inaugurated on the 20th of January, 21, and leads a broad range of planning themes, including promoting the 21st century garden cities. And certainly I'd recommend if you have the time to, to pop onto the RTPI website and have a look at the, the manifesto and um, you know, ways, writings and blogs. They're, they're certainly uh, interesting from a, a broad range of planning matters. Um, also, uh, one of the reasons Way has uh, kindly uh, attended is today is the RTPI president visit to the Northeast, even though it's um, kindly virtual uh, at the moment, obviously due to lockdown measures and obviously following lockdown relaxation, we can certainly look forward to inviting way back um, to the Northeast in person to enjoy the hospitality and um, you know, the, 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 the depth and breadth of uh, planning matters across the Northeast, which I'm sure we would all, uh, certainly enjoy um, presenting to way in person. Um, Wei, would you like to um, say anything to uh, the delegates uh, as part of the event? Thank you very much, Joe. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Wei Yang, president of the Royal Town Planning Institute. It's really my great pleasure to come here today because actually this is my first presidential visit and I come to the Northumberland and uh, uh, the northeast because actually i've been to northumberland once i drove past it i was thinking how beautiful here it is i, I was actually on top of my list to come back to visit the forest so i really have my great pleasure to come here as the first uh, presidential visit so thank you very much for having me this afternoon uh, for my presidency my top, top priority is to inspire um, the planning profession again and really uh, think about um, Say, um, I want to really uh, inspire our future generations, and also I want to through that I want to celebrate the success of the planning profession, and also think about how we can help to lay a foundation for the future of the planning profession. So, I believe the fundamental objective of the planning profession is to create a balanced system for people, nature, and society to coexist in harmony. I think a lot of people think the planning profession is only about built environment. But actually, we are very much about the natural environment as well. So I think today's theme is directly relevant to what I want to promote about the natural environment and the well-being. And the thing about how planners can proactively address the climate uh, emergency and the biodiversity uh, decline. So thank you very much for having me again. And I look forward very much to listen our excellent speakers and uh, your how and the, your contribution to um to the natural environment and the well-being thank you all right well uh, thank you way that uh, aligns and uh, tags in quite well with uh, my intro for today's speakers we've got uh, three excellent speakers that I'm uh, like way I'm certainly looking forward to their presentations uh, we've got uh, Richard Powell uh, the partnership and expertise manager from the forestry commission um, Richard's uh, worked for the Commission uh, in Wales and Northern England uh, for the last 32 years uh, on the bio care, so that's certainly impressive from my book, um, in a range of different management roles and locations, and in the last 20 years has advised on promoting woodland creation and sustainable woodland management in the Northeast. Uh, we have uh, Victoria Banks Prices, uh, planning advisor uh, for the Forestry Commission, uh, Victoria has worked in both local government and the private sector, similar to myself, so uh, a, a breadth of experience there. Uh, Victoria spent eight years working for the Woodland Trust, where she led their planning work, culminating in a successful campaign to strengthen the MPPF protection for ancient woodland and trees. Uh, and as mentioned, she's now the planning advisor for the Forestry Commission. And we also have Tim Miller-Fay, 
who is the economic advisor, uh, energy uh, in brackets, uh, I believe, in, in the title for Northumberland County Council, my uh, former stomping ground for a number of years. Uh, Tim has worked in the public sector with environmental sustainability for over 14 years and includes higher education estate support as well as with local authorities. And at the council, he leads as an economic advisor with a focus on clean and sustainable growth. So without further ado, I'd like to, uh, to hand over to Richard. Uh, the, the floor is yours, even though we don't have one. So the virtual floor is yours. Um, and I think we're now going to turn our webcams off and leave, leave you to uh, present. Okay, good luck. Thank, thank you, Joe. Um, and I hope you can all hear me uh, and see me. Um, one of the advantages of living in beautiful rural Northumberland is the landscape. One of the disadvantages is that we're still at the end of copper wire and haven't got rural broadband quite everywhere yet. So my apologies if I have to turn my camera off to deal with the um, restricted bandwidth that I'm, I'm, I'm working with uh, today. And, and we, you must come up in person to um, to Northumberland and, and come see us and uh, experience firsthand the, the people and places, um, not only in Northumberland, but the, the broader Northeast. You'd be very, very welcome. So um, without further ado, uh, I'll start my presentation. Um, so just a very little bit of background before I dive into detail. I'm a, I'm a chartered forester and I did a master's in forestry and land use planning at Oxford University many, many years ago. So I have a particular personal interest in the interface between uh, planning, particularly strategic uh, land use planning. And uh, of course, currently we've got a massive opportunity to uh, increase the amount of woodland in order to deliver substantial benefits for for, in terms of climate uh, mitigation, um, but also to improve the environment. For both people and the, the other animals that we, um, that we live amongst. So um, you might be thinking, well, what is the Forestry Commission? Not everyone has a clear understanding of our, um, of our kind of role and structure. Um, so we're, we're a non-ministerial government department, although we, we, we're kind of hosted by DEFRA. Um, and and what, we, what do we do? What are our priorities? We, we expand and we improve England's woodlands and forests. Uh, that kind of sells it, or says it rather, in a, in a nutshell. And we've also seen that. We, we regulate forestry activity. Um, we incentivize uh, sustainable forest management and woodland creation. Uh, we provide uh, advice and uh, support, information, um, so a large number of tools at disposal. And of course, we, we work by direct action as well. Um, through the work of um, one of the three parts of the Forestry Commission that we now call Forestry England. Sorry to interrupt, Richard. Would Would you like to go off screen and see if that will boost your signal, please? Forestry England that manages all, all the, most people will think of as the Forestry Commission's woodlands and forests across England. Um, that's 18% incidentally of all Right. Um. Um. Uh. Sorry, I've just uh, interrupted. Help my briefly. voice. Right. No, it's all right, Richard. If uh, um, I think you can be back now. Yeah. Show me if you can't hear me clearly. So. Yeah, I can hear you well. I'll give you a few more seconds, Richard, because okay. you've, you've got. Well, to... Hopefully, I'm back. Yeah, um, yeah, you're back. You're so, back now. So, 
the Forestry Commission, as you probably might imagine, is part of the nature. I do apologise. Um, I'll move on to the next slide. So I hope you've got a sense of what for commission is. Richard, Richard, uh, would so you, uh, the, you keep dropping off? Um, would you, would you like a moment? Ambition, to... um, as many will know, um, a, 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 an, an ambitious target to be created. Um, no specific is is also confirmed in the. <laughs> Richard, um, you keep dropping off. I, th I think we're going to recommend that we just uh, move across to Victoria, as we've uh, discussed off screen. Uh, before the event, um, and hopefully you can reboost your connection. All right. So, uh, all right, Victoria, the floor is yours. Uh, Richard, are you able to go on to mute, please? You can. Um, Victoria, you're on mute. I need, I need to unmute. There we go. Can you see my yeah. screen? Yeah, yeah we can see you. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everybody. I Maybe. am Victoria. Oh, here, Richard as well. Hi, everybody. I am Victoria Banks Price. On the yeah. Okay. Can you still hear me, Way? Yep. Okay. Um, I'm Victoria Banks Price. Planning Advisor at the Forestry Commission. Thank you ever so much for inviting me um, up today. Um, so I just wanted to sort of say a little bit about why the Forestry Commission is interested in planning. Um, trees, as you said in your introduction, make, tree, make places better for everyone. Um, and that they, they really positively contribute to the environments we live in, um, not just in a rural context, but in an urban context too. But also planning is a major threat for trees. Um, annually, at the moment, we are losing about 350 to 400 hectares of tree cover per annum in England to development, which is obviously incredibly significant at a time when we are trying to up our planting rates because those mature woodlands are already contributing to the ecosystem services that we all need. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, moving on. Has my slide moved on way? No. Okay. There we go. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the Forestry Commission's role in planning. We have a number of different roles. So we're statutory consultees on minerals and waste aftercare conditions. And we're also statutory consultees on NSIP projects. Um, but the one that we probably have the most um, regular sort of interaction with planners on is our non-statutory role regarding ancient woodland. We're non-statutory consultees on developments that um, could potentially impact ancient woodland. And um, we have a standing advice that we hold with Natural England and our sort of first port of call um, is to share that standing advice with um, local authority. So we'd ask that people go straight to that. But if you think a more bespoke um, ad, um, advice is required on a specific case, then please do contact us directly. Um, I've got the um, website address for Yorkshire in the North East um, down in the bottom right hand corner here. Um, so we're really always really keen to work with local authorities where we can help make developments better, where that bespoke help can be useful because we are the government's forestry experts. We're by no means planning experts, um, but we are forestry experts. So it's bringing that that forestry expertise in there. And that can be helpful with things like if you feel that permitted development rights in um, in a woodland setting, if you're thinking about um, how, how many forest tracts are actually needed, how big does that woodshed need to be, questions like that, um, then the Forestry Commission is always happy to help with those type of things. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit um, about what is happening proactively in the world of um, trees and planning. Um, in um, 2019, the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission was set up 
and they reported in 2020. And we had lots of great things coming out of that um, report on trees. And it really recognised, it really put a strong emphasis on street trees and the multiple benefits that they bring to people and places. They clean the air, they slow the traffic. There are so many benefits and they don't just make beautiful places, they make beautiful, well-functioning places. Um, and the, but they also recognise some of the problems that are stopping street tree planting. Um, so particularly like um, the lack of expertise in local authorities as the role of tree officers. Um, there's been less tree officers in local authorities um, and also sometimes a risk adverse approach taken by highways engineers. Um, so the government um, published their response to the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission. Um, but we're also see, are starting to see policy changes coming as well. Um, so in January, the um, draft MPPF was published a consultation that goes on until the 27th of March. And we were absolutely thrilled to see that it promotes street tree, tree planting in new developments. Um, we're, it obviously also improves the draft improves protection for existing trees. Um, and we were really thrilled, uh, me personally, to see that the RTPI have come out to say that you're really keen that um, you're keen to have new tree planting in existing developments as to that's really, really important that we all feel these benefits. And then we've got the National Model Design Code. And as planning reforms potentially take us into a, a more coded approach to planning, that National Model Design Code um, sets out the national standards that we can all use to build our local model design, local design codes. Um, and then um, in the um, trailer for this um, event, we I was talking about the um, England Tree Action Plan, uh, about the, the England Tree Strategy. Um, that has now been renamed. We've got a working title of England Tree Action Plan that hasn't yet been confirmed by ministers. Um, but just to say that that is the new, the, the potential new title for the um, England Tree Strategy. Um, so that is coming soon. Thank you ever so much to everybody who responded to the consultation on that. Um, you may think as planners, why would we be interested in the England Tree Action Plan? But there's lots of things in there for planners. Um, there's a, a few that I can talk about at the moment. So we've got the Ancient Woodland Inventory Update. That's an ongoing project. Um, I know that conversations are happening in Northumberland about how that can be getting up and running. Um, at the moment, you probably know that ancient woodland is measured at sites above two hectares and this is to bring down that so that all woodland down to 0.25 hectares will be covered so it brings out it, it sort of will remove that element of jeopardy whereas at the moment applications come forward and no one's entirely sure whether it's ancient or not so hopefully this will speed up planning um planning applications but also ensure better protections for those most important woodlands um, we're also continuing to do some work on research into the impacts of development on ancient woodlands. Um, I hope that in the future this should be useful in building up that evidence base that planners will be able to use in terms of making decisions and um, developing policy. Um, there's also um, lots of work going to develop guidance to help local authorities um, create their own trees and woodland strategies. That's something that local authorities have been asked to do in the past, um, but there hasn't been that national guidance there to support them. So that should be a positive move. Um, but I didn't want to just talk about what is coming down the pipeline, um, because that can sound a bit sort of manana, manana. Um, I wanted to talk about some of the great things that planners are doing at the moment. And um, I think one of my favourite examples um, is in Wickham, where they are being really, really positive in their local plan to promote um, tree canopy cover. Um, so the average canopy cover in um, in England is about 18%. In London, there are commitments to, 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 rise, to raise that up, but Wickham have come out specifically and um, said that on these specific sites outside town centres that are 0.5 hectares or more, they want to achieve a canopy cover of 25%. So it's really great to see planners sort of 
using this evidence to create proactive positive policies and then the, it um they've got within town centers they, they're re required to maximize these these opportunities for improving canopy cover so it it's just strengthening it and being so much more positive which is really great to see um i also wanted to highlight um things that are going on in terms of thinking about what trees you've got already to improve your local plan evidence base and i know that newcastle have been very proactive in doing this um that um they they had commissioned an eye tree survey in 2018 but i just wanted to sort of promote this this these tools that if you can work out the value of the trees you've got and the tree canopy cover you've got already um you can really work out where to sort of focus those policy target those policies um and in terms of woodland creation where do you need it and how do you put trees in places that most benefit people um because i think just looking at the Newcastle findings, the, the average in Newcastle came up as 18.1%, but the variation across the city was absolutely huge. Um, in the Parklands wards, you've got 31.6%, 31 whereas in the Castle ward, it was only 10.2%. And there were such clear correlations between the community well-being and that tree cover I think they're really important lessons for us as planners to take on board and how we can create better places and how these places being rich in woods and trees is really important for for people as well as the wider environment um so i just want to say thank you ever so much for inviting me along today um and just another plug that if you want to talk to us in terms of planning applications if you could use that top website uh, what email address and we're really keen to engage proactively with you um but but just to say if if you don't think that any specific advice is needed please have a look at our standing advice as a sort of as a first point of call and if you'd like to contact me directly there are my details thank you ever so much thank you so much victor thank you such an inspiring uh, presentation and i learned a lot thank you Right, fantastic. Thank you very much, Victoria. Very, very uh, informative and certainly, um, you know, throws the net a little bit wider than, you know, planners in the private sector or local authority, just to obviously un understand the, the wider remit of planners as, as a profession. Um, now, I'm just wondering, um, wh should we go to Tim or should we try going back? Um, no, we've, got Richard, we've got Richard. We've got Richard there, Joel. Oh, perfect, Richard. Uh, I'll return the floor to you, uh, Richard. Um, uh, off you go. Thank you very much. I'll disappear again. Can you turn your mic on, Richard? Nothing yet, Kim. Yeah, I think if we jump across to Tim um, and then we'll see, try and get Richard I don't know whether back. you can hear me or not. Oh, oh, yeah, you're back, Richard. All right, do you want me to move to, to Tim? Yes, please, <laughs> that'd be great. All right. Um, it, it might Tim, be I, worth... If, if Victoria's connection is better, I wonder whether it's worth Victoria running through the rest of my presentation. Okay, yeah, yeah, that that, that works. I mean, Victoria was uh, had a fairly solid connection. Um, I'll we'll, we'll let Tim present his, and then obviously, if you can send it through to um, Victoria, then that would be much appreciated. Thanks, I've got it. Right. Okay, Tim, uh, the, uh, the floor is yours and then I'll return to Victoria. Uh, yep, thanks very much. Um, just checking, Kim, is this is the presentation on the shared screen? Yes, but could you make it full full screen? Perfect, thank you. 
Okay, thanks very much, everybody. Thanks for the time and the opportunity. Um, I'm sorry you didn't hear Richard's uh, presentation. It would put some context into the ambition to create more woodlands and forests uh, throughout the county. Um, but hopefully this will give you a, an indication. Um, so the Great Northumberland Forest, um, we um, have been tasked with the um, creation of, of, of more woodland as part of the government's drive to, um, to increase uh, the amount of woodland cover that we have. Um, essentially, what we aim to do within, the, within our forest, within the Great Northumberland Forest, is to leave a, a much more diverse and better productive natural environment um, for, for many future generations to enjoy. Um, so we haven't been given a, um, a, a narrow brief for this. We've been given a, a brief which um, covers all potentially different types of um, uh, different types of woodland as well. Um, so it'll be different types of sizes. There is no one large space that we can plant that would make up an entire forest, um, but it needs to be created to, to suit the local needs. So the interests of um, the audience who um, will benefit from it, our visitors, our residents, holiday makers, and businesses, and that can include uh, small orchards, small community woodlands, the type we see in community forests, to the larger scale um, mixed uh, and commercial schemes. Um, and what that does is it allows us to bring together um, a wide um, variety of interested stakeholders from farmers who may have land um, to the forestry sector um, to um, ensure that biodiversity uh, and recreation um, all a part of the makeup of the forest. Um, using um, a, an approach for, for, for mapping um, and national characteristics approach, we look at the county as a whole, um, and you'll see within within this slide, there is the border moors and forests area, uh, the more high level hills and the cheviots, across to the coastal plain, um, um, and, and a very large area um, in terms of county, but in terms of planting trees, um, we have to map this and plan this in such a way as that we always make the right investment um, into, um, into our forest creation with, with a balance um, of what we've already got and what we want in the future, and particularly um, across all three areas of sustainability. So that is the economic side, which is the timber and commercial production, um, it's the environmental side, so that's biodiversity and climate action, and, and also the social side. What is it the social benefits of forest creation and woodland creation can make? Um, so we feel you know, there are many core benefits from, from, from this new creation. Um, Way was kind enough to, to, to say how beautiful Northumberland is, and it's important that those landscapes that we have um, and any new ones we make are enhanced and, and still remain an attractive place that they reduce our climate change impacts. Um, the, the, the forest creation within our climate action plan, which was approved by cabinet um, a couple of weeks ago, um, our sequestration of carbon and storage of carbon is a key part of our net zero target. Without it, we simply wouldn't, wouldn't be in the ballpark to, to have the ambition to do that. We're, we're pretty blessed in, in that um, a large, more than half of our emissions are negative. So that's sequestered carbon from, from land use. Um, and, and of course, we have emissions output from, from agriculture and, and from, from peat areas which are um, releasing carbon. Um, it's not all one sided, but we, we certainly have a great benefit from, from, from what we do in terms of our climate change impacts. And we want our woodland to continue to do that. But equally, we need to support the forestry sector, uh, the wood processing business. It's, a, it's an important economic part of, of the county. But equally, we need recreation areas. and, and um, during the relaxing of the various lockdowns has been in the last year, uh, our areas in the National Park and, and some of the uh, Forestry Commission woodlands, um, Thrunton, Kielder, example, so exceptional footfall, more than we've, we've seen in a long time, as people need to get out for, for their well-being to, to, to natural areas. So woodlands need to be of recreational use areas where you can actually go and walk and stroll or bike um, or ride. Um, we need to expand our habitats for our plant and wildlife, and I'll touch on this quite a bit. Um, we're, well, we're blessed enough to have a, another DEFRA-funded pilot, as well as the Forest of a Nature Recovery Strategy pilot, which um, sets about um, what we want to recover from nature through prioritising our habitats and species. And, and trees obviously have an effect on those, um, positively or negatively, so we need to, to consider that quite considerably. And we, of course, we want to provide clean air and water 
and support the green recovery that we're, they've seen across uh, our county. Um, so delivering this will deliver those national objectives that Richard's touched on earlier in his presentation about increased coverage. Um, what it does is it brings together stakeholders um, and our Woodland Creation Partnership, so Forestry Commission, um, the National Park, the Wildlife Trust, uh, the Environment Agency, um, we have a number of key stakeholders uh, that are helping us drive these um, these targets uh, for forest creation by local coordination. And um, the, the makeup of our woodland creation group is very similar to that of our local nature recovery group. Um, so there are some obvious synergies there. And although it's probably slowed progress of the forest creation down because we've taken a nature recovery approach, it's going to be increasingly important to do that from a planning point of view because if you think about planning a net diversity gain and increases in um, in things like uh, ELMs, um, increases in the uh, legislation such as the Environment Bill, set targets for clean air, set targets for biodiversity, this will only come together, um, which puts a more nature-focused approach. Um, so forestry has to be done um, in a balance with that. So we're happy to deliver the forestry um, ambition of this through an integrated land use and a natural capital approach, which uh, which looks at nature recovery um, aligned to our strategy pilot, which is ongoing. Um, it's a five-step process and, and we should be finishing that in the next two to three months and come up with a strategy pilot for how we recover nature. And trees will be, be, be a, a part of that. Um, they will be a habitat and, and the species that are supported by them will, will certainly be in that. Um, so far, from a revenue perspective, DEFRA have funded us from the Nature for Climate Fund um, um, two posts, which are being interviewed today and tomorrow. Um, a programme manager who will oversee the creation of the forest, and importantly, an analyst um, who can um, map tree opportunities, but um, also delve a bit deeper into the layers of that nature recovery. So um, things like peat, um, which is which is prominent in in Northumberland and has a huge climate benefit and a regulation benefit um, um, to different species, to different types of uh, habitat. So we have a whole picture um, of what we're doing and, and planning. Um, these are two-year fixed posts. Uh, we got funded for year one. We did have to take on year two at, at our risk, but we're confident that DEFRA would, would fund year two, which has now been approved, although there was a, a slight 10% cut. Um, and at the moment, years three, four, and five are of unknown status for the project, but the Nature from Climate Fund is a five-year program, so uh, we're quietly confident that, that these posts will um, be five years, and, and we do have the potential to increase um, with um, perhaps woodland advisors. Um, what we have to be careful is that, as colleagues have said earlier, in Forestry Commission and Forestry England and in the National Park, there are a number of advisors, and what we're keen to understand is this this joined up whole systems approach to planning woodlands is that we take into account nature. So any advice we wish to give is based on the right decision for the for the for the landowner, um, and whether that's nature recovery from woodland, whether that's nature recovery from peat, or from wild meadow, um, or for food, um, we we want to be um, in a position to understand the whole picture. Um, we, were, we commissioned um, staff at the Northumberland National Park who had already um, mapped out about 50% of the upper chain um, in the county. Um, what this mapping did was it discounted constraints, so public footpaths and peat, deep peat, um, ancient monuments, uh, to try and get a, a, an understanding of just what hectare opportunities there, there, there are for us for creation of uh, the Great Northumberland Forest. And as I said, it needs to be done within th this nature recovery approach. Um, this should closely align to um, forestry sectors work on their opportunity mapping um, and, and it'll be interesting to see how the two maps align so we can get the quick wins of commercial mixed woodland and, and those more um, um, broadleaf woodlands or more community woodlands, accessible woodlands that, that, that we want to see because we do understand that um, whole assessments, um, so when we take, take an approach where we look at the whole picture, we can make better decisions and therefore consider people, place, uh, nature, our economy, and our habitats and, um, and species. Um, we have made progress. Uh, we've got a video to show you, and I'm, I'm hoping that it's going to work fine. Um, we've got about 200 hectares delivered through existing schemes, and there's more in the pipeline, which Richard can touch on um, in his presentation. Um, we have a large landowner who's interested 
in, in, in forestry um, and our existing grant support system which which Richard will go into um, is delivering um, new forests without without a doubt um, but what we're keen to understand is how we can meet the government's enhanced targets so this is the 30,000 hectares um, per year that he that he indicated and also um, to set ourselves an ambitious target we were initially given a 500 hectares target by 2025 which we were very confident that will be done um, looking at the uh, you know looking at the current arrangements for planning and um, focus on forestry uh, but we need to be in a position to, to look for a capital ask and revenue um, to break down some of the barriers that might be in our way um, and 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 ask for um, a system of how we're going to create the Great Northumberland Forest in terms of funding whether it's additional um, whether it's complementary um, or whether it's strategic advice that that is yet to be understood um, but it has to be based on evidence of need so splitting that sustainability um, diagram into its three constituent parts uh, the evidence of need needs to take into account the economy the environment and, and society so i'll just try and um, open this this is a um we've chosen this because it's a good example of a modern forest so we've badged this as a part of the great northumberland forest and hopefully this will give you an idea of the kind of things that that can be achieved um in a, in a, in a natural capital setting Now is 145 hectare forestation scheme in the middle of the Kielder Forest. The first wooden creation like this scale that we've done as an organisation for around the last 20 years. The site was designed using a natural capital assessment tool which took the habitat data that we had for the site and then looked at how we would change and deliver aspects of natural capital, whether it's for tourism, timber, climate and biodiversity. And then looking into that, the aspirations of the organisation and government's 25 year environment plan are more woodland block of carbon the benefits which woodland provides for people nature and the economy as part of the design process we consulted with local stakeholders and community to really make sure that the design catered for their interests one of the concerns raised was the impact of the view over Kilda water so we left an area of open space framed by an exit wall leaves to make sure that it's there for people to enjoy in the future it's completely different to restocking a clear fell site you've got features you've got tracks this was an open green rolling hill and it was just the sheer scale of it. Literally walking around with the maps, with the GPS units, a lot of bamboo canes and marking out the actual plant zones so that from a distance you can pick out what the forest would look like and how that was going to happen. Once the site's been marked out, that's when we got the machines in. Continuous mounding is a system we don't normally use in our restocking programme. We were chosen for this site primarily because of less soil disturbance. Yes, very straight lines, but very minimal impact on the general site. The vegetation quite happily moved back. The grass will provide some shelter and competition at the same time. We've built a kilometre or so of new road in here, which was done by the Forestry and Civil Engineering team. The road was built to enable us to establish the new one. It will be there to help us manage it going forward, but it also provides opportunity for the public there is old historical pathways that come up this site and I have seen with the improvement of the road more public coming in here and making use of this facility. Planting quarter of a million trees on Lushy now is no easy task and involved a army of volunteers and contractors. Most of the contractors will plant somewhere around 2,000 trees per day. The planting in total took about a month and a half to complete. That included all the volunteers coming in later on Volunteers are important to a project like this. It's part of the overall natural capital or value of the project that people are involved. We had a big range of volunteers taking part from the guests of Calvert Trust, North East Companies, Newcastle University, we've had school groups. Lots of our members of staff wanted to use their volunteering base to take part as well. Our volunteers planted a total of 30,000 trees which is an amazing effort. <coughs> Lushy now has a mixture of conifer and broadleaf species which were chosen for their climate suitability. The species that will grow in this soil conditions and this weather conditions and either produce good timber or will produce nice soft edges for recreational points of view. If you come back five, ten years time you'll see established trees. We've already got trees coming out of tree tubes so they're doing really well. 
there is a couple of protective areas within the site for species protection and vegetation protection. We have seen there's a break bar now, and I have actually seen a red kite on this site, which is very rare for up here. The osprey, they're often seen flying over and out over the reservoir, and of course, there's deer and foxes. So, having the chance to work on this project at Mushy Now was an honour and a challenge because we haven't done woodland creation for a number of years. I was able to really enjoy it, and I found that really stimulating just to do something a bit different. Develop a bit of land that's been grazed on for many years, enhancing the views, enhancing the plantation, enhancing the wildlife benefits. We're very proud of the project as an organisation. It's a great example of collaboration between different fields and expertise involved with staff within the district, with national colleagues, and also the input from stakeholders. And hope it will act as a leading example of modern, well designed forestry. I'm enormously proud to work on a project like this. It gives me a great deal of satisfaction to see uh, a group of volunteers come together and work really hard and then see the satisfaction on their face at the end of the day. Rushing now will be a benefit for many generations to come from carbon storage to timber production, wildlife and local economy. I really hope that those that took part in planting the trees will come back to see the benefit for their labour in years to come. So I hope that's give you an indication of, of, of what modern forestry looks like. And, and it's it's great to see that partnership collaboration and volunteers and certainly from, from many businesses, corporate social responsibility point of view, they do look at more um, volunteer days for their staff to get involved. Um, so you know, seeing them going in the ground in, in this mixed scheme, um, it's really nice because we, we talk about a lot about the planning of it and, and have a lot of discussions, but actually seeing trees going in the ground and, and seeing the difference they make to to the economy and biodiversity and and society, it's it's really nice to to capture that. Um, so the things we need to consider, the barriers that we have, um, I'll, I'll talk about them and the risks um, that that are um, apparent for landowners. There's also existing stewardship grants, so a lot of a lot of the county is in existing agricultural stewardship, so they they they're getting paid for. Um, working their farms in different ways, and we need to understand how 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 that fits into any changing legislation in the future, and and grant awards. The the, the grant um, process, uh, the grant landscape is is very varied at the moment. From the nature of the climate fund, there are community forests, national forests. Uh, there's our own forest, the northern forest, um, and they have different um, uh, different um, processes in terms of their funding and their cash flows. So we need to be quite clear about that um, and consider biodiversity through our nature recovery plan. What we really need to know is, is, is how much per hectare our landowners, our private landowners, um, can, can earn from forest creation and whether it's based on the current uh, um, grants that, that, are, that are issued um, from the forestry sector um, or whether something additional is needed um, to try and increase the, the amount of forest that's going in. And then there are conflicting interests from landowners. They they have plans for sheep or cattle, or they have you know, in in the future they may not wish to plant trees on their land um, if it's going to be you know, 25 years before they can take them out if they're commercial. Um, it's it's a big investment for them. It's a big change to their to to their process of their their businesses. Um, so uh, there's a whole host of things to consider at the moment, um, and and I think. Um, Things like avoided cost models, where you may ask a landowner to, to, to plant trees to be part of the forest, and um, 12 years down the line, they could have perhaps done something else with that land, which may have um, added a, a more financial benefit to them, or even a climate benefit um, um, in the form of either potentially a solar farm um, or a um, or a restoration of peat, if, if that was if that was typical. I mean, there are lots of regulations in place to prevent. Um, the wrong kind of forest being created in the wrong area. That 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 you know that's just not simply going to happen. Um, but we just want that bit more detail through our pilot that's that's ongoing now. And we need to consider how much carbon is captured and stored. When we do our climate sessions, we had one last night uh, for the general public in the county. We do get asked how do you factor in trees which no longer store carbon or no longer sequester carbon or only store carbon. 
or, or um, naturally um, naturally die off and, and decay. How are you um, accounting for that? Um, because people are much more savvy to um, net zero targets. So they ask questions about how, do, how, how are mature trees factored in for your, are you using the woodland co uh, carbon code, for example, for um, the amount of carbon that you can capture? All of that needs to be transparent. Um, there's increasingly green finance available where um, there are private investors um, or even government funds or, or leveraged funds uh, where we can stack benefits to try and create forests more, more quickly. We need to consider existing woodlands and how they join on to new woodlands. And then we've got competing uh, interests. Um, Red Squirrel is um, one of the few last areas uh, in Northumberland where they're, they're, they're protected. The number of schemes to protect them through the Wildlife Trust. Um, we're pretty confident that Pine Martins are in, in the Kielder area. Um, and that has a relationship to the battle between red and grey squirrels. But equally, uh, curlew um, can uh, have its eggs um, taken and snatched from predators that, that benefit from the edges of forest. So there are a number of things to consider when you take a, a, this sort of nature recovery first. So all of these things are being considered at the minute, as well as the economic and social benefits. Um, it was touched on earlier um, that ecosystem services, if we could put a value on what a forest brings, if we could understand from its provisioning and supporting systems. Um, so, so, for example, if you take a forest which has a visitor centre and a cafe and a bike hire, um, such as Kielder, um, can we actually put a value on what this brings? And when you can value things um, fairly and honestly, it does help significantly in where you should be making your investments. Um, we touched on the England tree strategy, or it's going to be given its new name, and we await uh, closely to see what that brings, as, as, as we are with the peat strategy. And agroforestry, a, a basic payment for, instead of having fields and fields of wheat and, and barley, you may have trees between um, and have a, a combination um, of, of um, agriculture and forestry, which is a potential in, in this area. Uh, wildlife corridors, um, that uh, goes without saying, we need to consider them. And also, what is part of the forest? Um, we are trying to squeeze all our assets as a council, looking at our country parks, our schools, um, our car junction. So we put a new junction in a few years ago at Morpeth on the A1. Um, and if uh, that is a fantastic example of how many trees can be planted. Um, so we need to determine uh, if we need to buy or lease land. Um, is it is it acceptable to, to do a long term lease to a farmer uh, so the or landowner or a tenant so they have a, a, a cash flow of um, future um, income for for the, for the life of that and and then the impact on food production if we're going to use if we're going to be very ambitious and we do change any land which currently is maybe used for arable or for meat um, how does that have an effect on the overall impact of the economics of both the farm and the county. So as I say, we, we, we're going to take a whole approach. We need to be able to speak the, the, the languages of the audience that we meet, from, from farmers to landowners to, to charities. You saw from the video um, from Forestry England there just how many people are interested in, um, in forests. Um, a one-stop shop would be fantastic, where we're given environmental advice on the benefits of all nature and what can be done, because it's about integrated land management. It's about planning the best outcome for the land, we do want to accelerate time to plant. We, we, want, to, we want to hit the ground running and, and keep this up, but we don't want to cut corners and regulation. Um, we, you know, they're there for a reason and they work well. Um, and we just want to remove the barriers to, so that the, the business as usual, um, which is under the 30,000 hectares per annum, um, it, it, we, we can meet that. Um, and that only, only happens with partnership working, um, the political will that, that we're seeing um, centrally and locally, and where we align it to climate strategies, I think it gets it gets a, a, a good traction in terms of that sequestration value. Um, so I say it's about land management use, which is integrated and, and considers a nature recovery approach. Um, and I hope that gives you uh, a good indication of of, of the forest uh, and, and where we're at currently. Thank you very much. That's great. I was really uh, inspired by the yeah. um, people's passion as volunteers. It's, uh, I'm really keen to be a volunteer as well. I think one of my dream to be the president was to plant, plant some trees uh, somewhere I visit, but I haven't got a chance yet. So maybe next time when I go to Northumberland, I should plant some trees as a volunteer. I'm sure it can be arranged, right? <laughs>
There we go. We can see the photo opportunity already. Uh, way, uh, uh, you know, breaking ground, uh, planting trees across the northeast. Um, and if by magic Victoria reappears uh, to obviously uh, <laughs> kindly um, uh, represent the, uh, the the first um, presentation, so I'll, I'll disappear once more. I'll, the floor is yours, Victoria. Oh, thank you ever so much, Joe. Can you see my screen, Way? Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so I will just whiz through um, Richard's slides um, quickly. Um, just a little bit of an intro to the Forestry Commission. Um, we're a non-ministerial government department. Our, object our, our, our um, objectives are to protect, expand and improve England's woodlands and forests. And we've got various different roles. Um, we regulate, incentivize and advise and support forestry. Um, we're made up of three different parts. So Richard and I both work um, for the Forestry Commission, who is that sort of regulatory policy side of things. Um, forestry England are the people that manage our nation's forests. So if you go out for a walk at Kielder, um, it's um, Forestry England who manage that. And Forest Research, who are based up in Scotland, who sort of back up all our work with um, loads of brilliant research. Um, so and we are sort of uh, key to delivering the government's woodland creation ambitions. Um, so what are those ambitions? Um, well, they are ambitious. Um, so we've got a manifesto commitment to increase the rate of woodland creation to 30,000 hectares per year by 2025. Um, there isn't a specific target for England, but it's generally accepted to be about to eight to 10,000 hectares per annum. Um, that hasn't been confirmed yet. We'll, we'll hit, have confirmation for that in the England Tree Action Plan. Um, to sort of give you a sort of sense of context, that's about five times the uh, sort of current planting level. Um, and it, that needs to be maintained way beyond 2025 to achieve net zero. So you, you see there is a, it's a huge impetus for planting. Um, so the Forestry Commission are very big on the right tree in the right place because we really need to capitalise those ecosystem services um, because if you, do, if you plant the right wrong tree in the wrong place you're not going to get the benefits that that tree can offer. So most of the planting will be happen, happening on private land, most of it farmland. Um, we're really interested in diversifying um, farms and integrating trees with agriculture and um, so we're thinking about capturing carbon producing wood and a mixture of both broadleaf and conifer um, and this of course as well as that net zero target is all about helping reverse and um, biodiversity decline there will also be a, as well as planting that we've obviously seen in Northumberland there will be an, an element of natural um, colonization um, so it's not just it's brilliant to see things happening in Northumberland, but it's also getting trees into urban areas as well and um, and getting trees close to people. Um, so how how do we ensure we have the right tree in the right place? Um, well, we have the UK forestry standard, which sets out the standard for sustainable forestry in the UK. Um, I, I like Richard's analogy here, it's a bit like the highway code it sets the benchmark for good practice and legal requirements. Um, um, as a planner like me, the UKFS is a big fat document. Um, you may just want to Google um, planner's guide to UK forestry standard and then there's a nice sort of two sides intro to it and it sort of picks out all the bits that are useful for planners. Um, obviously, if you want to know more though, everything you need to know about forestry is in the UK forestry standard about how to do it well. Um, so the purpose of whoops, there we go. The purpose of the UK forestry standard is to balance all these different factors. It's about those ecosystem services, and as planners, that is what we do. So um, I think that's something that is well understood by the planning community. Um, so it's all of the main drivers and opportunities to make land management more sustainable. As I said before, it's about those different challenges about tackling climate change, supporting the nature recovery, as well as making more beautiful and productive places for us all to enjoy. 
Um, so it's a, a little bit from the, the FC context. Um, we are growing very rapidly. Um, we have just recruited 105 new staff and the, our new sort of ongoing recruitment up until March 2022. Um, there's a big change in the way that grants are being managed and delivered. They're increasing in their scope, but also being simplified. So it should be more straightforward for you to plant trees on your land. Um, and they're also um, being targeted for different groups. So again, it should be more straightforward. Um, Forestry England, as I said, who manage um, our nation's forests are getting involved and there'll be more planting on the public forest estate. And there'll be links in there with biodiversity net gain. So um, there will maybe scope to um, plant on the public forest estate through biodiversity net gain credits. Um, but also working to address the sector capacity, upskilling um, people in forestry, um, and obviously lots of partnership projects, one of which we've just seen. Oops. And um, um, Tim or Richard may want to jump in on this one because I'm afraid my local knowledge is a bit minimal. Um, um, but the Northeast is really a sort of centre of excellence, really, in terms of what's happening. We've got some huge, um, great projects there that we've just seen. I'll leave these up on screen for you. Um, but Richard, yeah, Richard may want to hop in at this point. Otherwise, it's a thank you very much from me. Thank you very much. You're such an excellent presenter, just stepping and then it's like your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Wei. You're very kind. <laughs> I, I noticed actually there's another uh, document uh, also published by the Forest Commission. It's about uh, climate change, managing uh, England's woodland in a climate in emergency. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we, you or Richard could it, uh, talk a little bit more about that document as well. I think that's a, it's a fairly new document and it will be very yeah, relevant. That, to... Yeah, that was published last year and is aimed at local planning authorities. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a really good way of, sort of working out. Um, there's tools in there that link to how you can work out um, what you should be planting in your um, in your authority in terms of species mix and provenance because it's as the climate changes um that what how trees react to it change and how, how making trees more resilient so provenance and um, species choice is very important but it also helps you um calculate how many trees you do need to be um planting so in terms of offsetting um the emissions that you're producing but yeah all sorts of things in there it's really useful Right. Um, well, thank you very much, Victoria, for your uh, double presentation. <laughs> Sorry about uh, that. See you much, oh, it's much appreciated. And uh, you know, as as was said earlier, I think uh, you know we're not all um, you know able to have uh, super fibre, uh, super duper fast uh, broadband. Uh, I was certainly worried about the hotel broadband here being able to do a video call, but it's holding up. So, um, right, just quickly, and I want to just uh, for those kind of de uh, the delegates. Uh, obviously enjoying today's uh, event. Uh, I realise we are pushing the boundaries of time. We are just going to dip into a, um, a panel uh, Q&A, um, even if it's a, a brief one. So please bear with us. If you do have to shoot off, thank you very much for attending. Um, and um, you know, I'll, I'll enter into the, the questions uh, forthwith. Uh, one of the questions um, you know, that was put on uh, from a uh, delegate was actually for the Forestry Commission and it was basically asking you know would the Forestry Commission like a greater protection for all woodland you know not only for instance ancient or semi-ancient woodland you know should there be a, a stronger policy uh, protection you know towards woodland as a, as a whole? Um, well obviously me personally of course I would definitely like that um, the Forestry Commission, that's one of the things that we are working with government to improve protection for woodlands, for all woodlands beyond ancient woodlands, because um, as we were saying, we've got these huge planting targets, but it makes absolutely no sense to be taking with one hand and to be planting with the other. Um, so, yeah, we are very much working um, with 
government and but obviously because of the way government works there's so many different competing factors but we are very much making our voice heard on that front right and uh way have you uh, have you got any uh, particular questions you, you'd like to um to offer to the the speakers yes i have one quick question i want to ask somebody told me uh for a tree to be carbon neutral it needs 18 years another one told me it's about 25 years what is the, the professional advice on that is richard is richard there richard so i i am not a forester um, um so um i would very much say it depends on the species um because everything with trees depends on different species but also where it's grown because a tree in one place like maybe thriving and be hitting those ecosystem services much earlier um whereas a tree in it that's not in the right place um won't be so effective so again it comes back to that message of the right tree in the right place so you can really be maximizing the amount of carbon they capture yeah and also that's really black your point about say once a tree is planted it needs to be there for a, a reasonable amount of time otherwise actually is really uh, the opposite option because actually yeah create more carbon generate yeah, exactly. more carbon yeah okay Right. Um, I, I do have one um, particular question, and it's either to Victoria or Tim, or even Wei. I don't mind. Um, you know, but to the floor, I would say, um, having driven around the country, and I live in Northumberland, and for instance, I'm, I'm going north of Troon, where I am now, and I'll be passing more woodlands in Scotland. Um, is there a shift? My problem is obviously when you look at commercial woodland. Um, quite often the ecological benefits of that commercial crop are maybe not as significant as maybe semi-ancient or kind of semi-natural woodland, you know, with broadleaf trees, et cetera. So, you know, is, is there a, a corporate or national steer towards um, the, the, the more ecological and environmental benefits of woodland rather than just commercial? There is, yes, and I think that's going to increase um, when in the future you will be paid public money for public good. So if you're increasing biodiversity and ecological diversity, then there, there will be payments linked to that. Um, but it's it's finding the, the, the magic balance because tim timber is needed um, for various yeah. reasons, for, for product, harvested timber products is, is a big part of the economy, um, but equally, the, we now know the value of biodiversity and when we can know that in terms of pounds, uh, mm -hmm. we've done, for example, the value of the Great Barrier Reef is known in the billions of dollars, of how much it's worth in terms of its, uh, what it does as a natural um, supporting system, but also for visitors, also for wildlife. I think once we understand that in terms of our biodiversity, we can then plant more accordingly and have that balance yeah. Balance mode. But I think you've seen from the forest creation at Rushino there, it is it is on consideration now, um, and I think that will only improve. And it'll probably, I think, when the climate emergency morphs into um, an environmental and ecological emergency, when people are more aware of that, the demand for greater diversity will only increase. But I do think the agencies are gearing up for that, um, and it, and it's simply a matter of time before that 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 ratio is is changed and, and is known but there are there are protocols in place for forestry creation of how much will be commercial and how much won't and space and, and hectareage so there, there are frameworks in place for that um, but i do think you'll see a big change when the environment bill passes through um through through parliament um in the in the coming years and i do think you'll see more planting with an ecological um stimulus to do that Okay. Um, I don't know, um, Rich, Richard has just messaged to say as well that it's worth noting that the fastest growing tree species capture the most carbon and it tends to be the conifers that grow the fastest and um, so they do have the dual purposes of, climate, of, of capturing more carbon and um, producing timber so as, as Tim said it's, it's having that mix. Mm -hmm. Right, well um... I think from my point of view as chair for today, I think we've certainly um, only slipped a few minutes past, which given technology uh, issues, I think that's a, that's not a bad uh, punt for the timing. Um, 
I would obviously like to thank uh, the attendees, which I can see on the screen are still here. So thank you very much for that. I'd certainly like to thank our speakers for today. It's been a diverse and informative range of presentations. And certainly I'm looking forward to getting the uh, the wellies and the spade out for when Way uh, you know, comes up and starts to break ground and plant a few thousand trees in uh, Northumberland. Well, uh, you know, make, make you worth your money. Uh, yeah, so, I'm, yes, I think. Thank you. Yeah, I'm impressed. One volunteer can plant 2,000 trees in a day. So <laughs> it's quite a target. Right. So, um, right. Well, in, in that case, um, if I hand over to my virtual assistant of Kim um, and say, um, you know, thank you very much to everybody. And we look forward to uh, seeing, well, not seeing you because obviously we're still virtual, but certainly uh, enjoying another. Uh, CPD event uh, in the forthcoming weeks. Okay. Thank you, for Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank, Thank you. And the key. Thank you, Wade. Thank you.